Welcome to all those who have logged into this webinar series, Remote Sensing Training Methods and Best Practices. My name is Brock Blevins, Training Coordinator for NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, and I will be your host for this three-part webinar series. Also contributing and presenting over the next three weeks will be Anna Prados, RSET's Program Manager, and Elizabeth Hook, RSET's Communications and Technical Writer and Editor. The purpose of this three-part series is to engage our fellow remote sensing capacity building programs, or those looking to establish programs, share some of the methods we at RSET have found to be effective, but also to begin and facilitate an ongoing conversation with all those who are participating online today. Over the past few years, working along with other training programs, we have seen that depending on the size and scope of a capacity building program, there are many successful methods to, to conduct remote sensing trainings. We'll dis discuss aspects of our program, but since we know there is no one size fits all model, we'll also be asking from those participating to enter into the discussion, to share the methods your programs employ, and ideally we can all learn from each other and create a robust network of capacity building practitioners. So how will we do this? Here is an outline for the three-week series. Week one, we'll cover end user needs assessments, promotions. Week two, we'll cover on-site or in-person trainings and evaluations. With week three covering online webinars or distance learning. Each week, we'll have a series of topics important to capacity building. For each, we'll discuss them in general provide insight into how RSET handles these topics. But also, and this is an important part of the process, after each topic, we'll open the forum and ask how you and your program addresses these topics and any other information you find important to discuss. Now, since we have scores of participants in the room, it will not be logistically possible to provide microphone privileges and to ensure that the microphone will work properly. Um, our audience is global for this training. Um, so when we have the open forum periods, we'll ask you to share your program's method. We'll also display the chat windows at the end. So you can copy and paste the responses from your fellow capacity building program managers um, and, and save those for uh, your own purposes. As you see here, these are the topics for each week ranging from end user needs assessments, promotions, to creating effective presentations, to all the details involved in conducting on-site and online or distance trainings. All of these topics fall into what we consider seven steps to a second, to a successful remote sensing training. Of course, one can break these steps down further or even add steps to the sequence, but that will be particular to your program and we look forward to hearing all of those and allowing the space to discuss them. But for our set, we have worked off this model, which begins with a, a mission, um, knowing your end user needs, developing a network, promoting and developing and conducting your training to evaluation of your trainings and not only of the training itself, but its efficacy, impact, and finding future needs, which uh, can be used to guide future iterations of a training life cycle. And the learning objectives throughout the three weeks from our set and from each other will be to understand the key steps to developing on-site and online trainings, how to build a network and promote, and how to conduct these trainings. To begin, I'll briefly introduce RSET, NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. And here is the team. If you've taken any of RSET's previous trainings, you might be familiar with some of the names on this list. Um, I have it here grouped by thematic area in which we instruct. We're a team of 15 spread across various NASA centers with a headquarters in Maryland at Goddard Space Flight Center. 
Our set is sponsored by the Applied Sciences Program within NASA's Earth Sciences Division. The Applied Sciences Program supports applied research and targets projects focused on innovative and practical uses of data from Earth observation satellites used to inform decision makers around the world. Our set works with Applied Science Program managers and principal investigators, data and tool producers to uh, communicate and train upon these data sets tools and portals that are operationally ready to be applied to disasters, land management or ecosystem forecasting, health and air quality, water resources, and wildfires management. And we do this in a, in a couple different ways. We provide online webinars, typically in a series format, convening for one hour per week for four to six weeks with a focus on data access demonstrations and applications. We also have on-site trainings. These will be two to four full days where we partner with a certain group of stakeholders and co-produce training materials, exercises, and case studies that will be most relevant to that particular stakeholder's um, organization. We also have a, a train the trainers program uh, for those who are interested in conducting their own remote sensing trainings. For both the on-site and online trainings, we, we take a gradual approach. Our fundamentals or remote sensing webinars are available for viewing on demand, and these are intended for those with little or even no experience in remote sensing. These will cover the satellite, the sensors, the terminology that will be necessary to understand the many application of these Earth observations. Level one or basic trainings then move on to specific applications such as air quality monitoring, land use change, or flood monitoring, where we'll highlight those specific data sets and tools, showing step-by-step -step portal access, discussing strengths and limitations of the data sets, and how to import those into a GIS. Our advanced trainings, or level two trainings, are available on site and as of recently, these are available online um, and we do this for a greater global reach. Using guided exercises and homeworks, these advanced topics include generating land cover maps, estimating water basin budgets, tracking exceptional air quality events, or running code to read level one or level two satellite swap data. Since 2009, ARCED has reached almost 8,000 participants from over 140 countries. Uh, and you can see the statistics here. Our, our health and air quality themed trainings were the ones that we started off with first, uh, which is why you see a greater number of those trainings compared to the other themes. But as you can imagine, we've had great interest in water resources, disasters, land and wildfire related trainings as of recently. It's built into our set's mission to reach as many around the globe as possible. And the maps here show if we've, we've been doing just that. Of course, not every capacity building program is mandated to train globally. Um, many train internally only. Some focus on one particular sector or theme. And this is all based on one's mission statement, which brings us to our outline for today's session. Today, with this session, we'll start off with uh, defining a, your program's mission statement. Uh, we'll then cover assessing end user needs, methods to build a network, training promotions, and developing training materials. After each topic, we'll open things up for discussion and sharing. So this brings us to our first step, developing a mission statement. So why do we do this? A, a mission statement defines the, the key purpose of a program, the intended audience, and the impact you wish to accomplish. And these are all key elements to help guide content, partnerships, and uh, the, the training activities going forward. So what we have is purpose, or what, audience, who, and impact, or in other words, why are we doing this? What is the end goal? For example, our set's mission is to increase the use of remote sensing resources by environmental manage managers for decision support. This is accomplished through on-site and online training that teaches participants how to access, visualize, 
and apply earth sciences data. So first is the purpose, and that is to build capacity of remote sensing through training, both on site and online. Who? Audience, environmental managers, decision makers, policy makers. And then the impact, what is the end goal? We want to improve decision support. So that is our impact and, and our value. So this will actually be a time where we're going to open this up and, and start uh, sharing with each other. Um, one moment while I minimize the slide here. And as you see, I've opened up a chat box. And uh, so this goes along with our first topic. If you are part of a capacity building program or you conduct trainings or you're in an in educational format in which you are teaching others on how to use remote sensing or spatial data like this, does your program have a, a mission statement? Is there something that, that drives your, your trainings as far as uh, what, who, and why? Um, so please, I, I encourage you to uh, type into the chat box here uh, what your mission statement, if you have one, for your, for your training program. If you do not have one, please feel free to peruse what other people are writing in here uh, and start to think about uh, what may be some, uh, a future mission statement would be for your, for your training program. Some pertinent information to, to maybe include along with your response is maybe just a little bit about the name of your program and maybe your targeted audience or sector. That kind of helps to kind of put your mission statement into a little bit more context. So I encourage you to, to write that as well. Okay, so we're gonna give you this another 30 seconds. So if, if you are typing something, um, go ahead and then uh, maybe finish your thoughts. Uh, if you're in the middle, uh, maybe save it off to the side, and we can use the end question and answer period where we'll open this back up to, to share. Um, but just uh, I want to move on soon, so I just want to not catch you in mid-typing. Before we move on to the next topic, end user needs assessments, I wanted to address, address a couple relevant terms. So going forward, we'll be using uh, these terms that you see here, participant, end user and stakeholder. And depending on your program, these terms might have different definitions or variations of them. But so you know, uh, this is how our set defines them. Participant, a person, organization who attends a remote sensing training. End user, a person or, or organization who uses remote sensing data and applies it to an environmental problem or question. This may be a decision maker uh, that may use that data to make decisions or help drive policy. And then stakeholder. Stakeholder is a person or organization who benefits or is impacted by remote sensing data, information or decisions derived from that data. So keep this in mind uh, if your program has slightly different definitions, but, but this is how I'll, I'll be referring to them uh, going forward. So let's talk end user needs. So these are the persons, organizations who use remote sensing data, or they, they may potentially be using remote sensing data. A, a key best practice for remote sensing training is to collect end, end user needs assessments and in a systematic way if possible. In order to be more effective as trainers, we need to understand the needs and the wants of the participants. This information can be integrated, integrated into decisions on training type, training content or topics, um, so they can be tailored to address the unique environmental or decision support challenges of our participants. These decisions can depend on the technical experience of the participants, their sector, 
or the types of questions they are seeking to address. A, a program should also uh, address these assessments through the training life cycle, both before and after the training. Uh, so the first step is to you know, establish a dialogue between the training program and the potential stakeholders uh, to determine if there's a match between stakeholder and user needs or what your training can provide. From there, a relationship can be established and in the best case, co-produce the agenda so, so needs can be fully integrated into the, the training content. After the training, interviews, surveys, or less formal means can be used to gather additional insight into end user needs. And this information can be used to direct future iterations of the training. Some of the tools a program can employ include training registration. Uh, this is information, I mean, besides demographics, you can also inquire with a couple quick questions what participants want to take away or the potential applications of the remote sensing data sets or tools they're looking for. Interviews can go a long way into digging deeper, setting up uh, a, a way to contact um, training participants in the future down, down the line and see what impact it, it had to their decision-making process uh, can also uh, really help you assess these needs. You can have ad hoc questions presented during a question and answer session. So many times uh, participants use this time to, to ask questions of the presenters, but uh, this can also be used to ask this captive audience about needs. Um, I always like to try to make it a discussion with a lot of back and forth to really begin to understand the participants' decision-making questions and potentially how, potentially how remote sensing can address them. Of course, there are uh, anonymous surveys, either pre- or post-training. Others include inserting yourself into that community of practitioner, practitioners by, by getting involved in user working groups. Or, or, or other subject matter expert um, forums. Whether made, at, uh, made of end users themselves, the data producers, or professional organizations or societies, uh, definitely finding a way to surround yourself uh, with, with your target uh, audience uh, can, can go a long way to truly understanding uh, their needs and their wants. A few of the many tips include to, as I mentioned previously, is to collaborate with a community. Be sure you're asking uh, very pointed questions, such uh, as to begin to understand their barriers uh, to using the data or, or needs, like you know, what is presenting your organization from fully using these remote sensing data sources? What is your organization's main type of research or environmental and management activity? Or, or what specific question or challenge is your organization trying to ad address? So in, in other words, what training topics do you want? Uh, what can we do to help serve you better? Is something that we at RSET is, is always trying to ask from our end user community. And, and finally, to assess if the training will if, in fact address those needs. Um, essentially, don't oversell what remote sensing can, can, can do. So this brings us uh, to the end of a, a new topic, but this presents an opportunity for us to, to share a little bit about how you share or collect your end user needs assessments. Um, and uh, once again, I, I encourage you to share with the community we have on board here. Uh, we have scores of people on and um, probably a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of different methods that people use, uh, very unique ones. We did a session earlier this morning uh, for those in some time zones to the east of us. And uh, there are some really unique ways that people are collecting end user needs. And I'm sure some of you are doing them now, too. Now, of course, I understand that this depends on the goals of your particular capacity building program. Um, so 
given that, that these end user needs assessments can take a, a number of different formats and desired outcomes. If you could just inform the group a little bit about how often you do your end user needs assessments, in what format, if there's certain ways that you found to be ineffective. That would be something very valuable to share as well, or why you found it to be ineffective. The next topic is building a network. Why do this? Well, th this depends on your, your program. If, if you train exclusively internally, a network may already exist. Uh, if you're like us and we wish to train globally to address a number of sectors and needs, this network serves to identify stakeholders and potential collaborators. Uh, it helps to find potential end users and training participants. This network also provides an ever-widening pool of those from which to inquire training or data needs in order to better tailor our content or discover potentially new training topics. If a large portion of your network is asking about, for example, train data and monitoring sea level change as applies to infrastructure planning or disaster mitigation, then there is a need that, that can be addressed. One way to handle the network is to main, maintain an end user database. We at our set, uh, since, since we are intended, our intended reach is so large, uh, we have a database that is sortable by location or sector, such as central government versus nonprofits or NGOs versus private companies. Um, our database is also sortable by organization or theme in which they attended the training, such as disasters, or health or air quality, or land management. We can also use this information to uh, identify gaps in coverage by region or sector. Uh, this way, gaps can be addressed by determining future promotion activities. Which brings us to our next step, training promotion. Once again, uh, this will be a program specific activity uh, for, for the scope of your training promotions to find the per appropriate organizations or persons to reach out to. For our set, we promote trainings to applied sciences professionals and decision or policymakers. Anyone who is able to make earth observations actionable. We also reach out to those who have shown environmental need, but also those who may not all we have not already previously reached, or, or those unaware of the benefits that NASA's open data sets and tools can provide. We also like to promote to those organizations with a high potential for future collaboration because a lot of times these groups have a, a unique knowledge of the communities in which they work and to their unique decision-making activities. And together we can better determine how remote sensing data can fit into that equation. Also, it's a very effective in that these are representatives from organizations. They, they tend to, to trust data and trainings if others within their community have shown its utility and success, so sharing success stories. Some common methods include uh, emails uh, mm -hmm. or a listserv, uh, these, these for networking, um, existing groups, uh, willing to cross promote your, your training, such as existing websites or portals that are designed to communicate training opportunities to others or within their particular uh, community, like the conservation community or disaster management community. Um, you also have uh, social media that is taking on so many different forms nowadays um, so that it has become actually in a very effective vehicle to get the word out uh, to your desired audience. For example, our set employs many of these methods 
with email and listservs accounting for almost half of, uh, of what has brought our trainings to the, our participants' attention. Um, whether it's coming straight from us or a listserv or passed on from um, somebody on our listserv to another colleague. Uh, we also use um, certain training websites that advertise training such as Fed Center or EO Portal or Earth Observations Portal. Um, if those attending this training here today are, aren't familiar with a couple of these these uh, portals, please, uh, I, I encourage you to check them out. There's a, there's a lot of great training opportunities and training organizations to connect with. Uh, we also perform targeted outreach and promotion, and, and this is for those in which we could potentially collaborate, or we also use our outreach database, and this is used to fill some of the gaps in coverage that we may have noticed from our past attendee lists. Um, lastly, Twitter is a, is a new platform for us. And Elizabeth Hook, our communications and technical writer, can tell you a little bit about that since that is her expertise. Right, so social media, like Brock mentioned, is a very big kind of hairy conversation. So we're only gonna unpack some general things and talk about Twitter briefly because that's what our set is using. If you decide to create a social media account of some type for your program, the very first thing you should do is have a clear idea of its purpose. This is going to help you figure out what kind of things you wanna post, what content is relevant, and it's going to help you out with just what you're going to be doing with it. Another component of this is that social media almost always takes more time to do well than most people think, think that it does. Once you create your account, plan on posting regularly and engaging with your community there regularly. This doesn't mean that you need to post something every hour, but for instance, with RSET's Twitter account, we typically tweet a few times a week and we try and respond to people in a timely fashion. One tool that can help you post consistently is maintaining a schedule of what you're going to do. You can figure out what you'll post when to keep from doing all of your posts at one time on one day or to see where you might need to fill in gaps. If you have a partner that wants you to promote one of their uh, components of your training, you might plan on reposting or retweeting something on a day. So as I mentioned, the only official social media account that ARSA has is its Twitter account. During our trainings, both online and in person, we typically plan out tweets. Um, these two images um, on the top are good examples of that. This one on the left is one that we have planned to promote our recent soil moisture and evapotranspiration training. And this one on the right is one we did during an on-site training in Brazil. So this is an example of a tweet where the training was taking place in Spanish. So we definitely had to plan those tweets out ahead of time to make sure that they could also get translated into Spanish as well. And in addition to having pre-planned posts, sometimes interesting facts or things are going to pop up in your training and so you can supplement your social media posting with those as well. Make sure as you're, especially if you're present during a training and you're tweeting or you're on Facebook or you're doing social media during your training, pay attention to replies and questions that come in so that you can make sure to either answer them if someone's having technical difficulty or convey the question to your trainer or your speaker so that they can answer it um, more publicly. The final component about social media that we're going to mention is that you should be aware of conversations happening about your program or organization that may not directly involve you. So for instance, Arsed had an incident on Twitter where I was checking um, our URL to see if anyone was talking about any of our trainings and in March, I was looking around and noticed this tweet that came up. Apparently, at an investigative reporters and editors conference, someone was giving a presentation on remote sensing data and mentioned RSET. 
And this tweet in particular caught my eye. It was only retweeted 12 times, which is not a huge number, but the people that retweeted it had a cumulative following of, um, of over 38,000 people. And that was just a huge audience that we didn't realize was going to become aware of our set. We didn't know our set was going to be in the presentation. And so just keeping a regular eye on things can also help you keep in touch with people that are having conversations about you, whether or not you originally intend for them to be doing it. So once again, I would like to open this up to a, a forum format and ask for those participants online here to share uh, a little bit about what you do on a programmatic level to promote your trainings. And some additional information may be useful for this particular question and sharing period. Uh, for instance, uh, you might want to include your target audience. Um, that's going to be very important to uh, couple with your answers. So uh, please uh, provide a little bit of extra text in context with your answer. We also have a couple polls going on right now. Uh, please feel, t feel free to participate. Um, a little bit about, uh, it looks like email is, uh, well, it's a very traditional way. And as you saw, we at our set use email uh, very often. Our listserv is part of that process. But also down below, there's also a, a question about, um, so of these promotional methods that we've discussed here today, um, are there ones that you'd like to know a little bit more about? possible we can uh, include that in a in a future um, in a in a future session of this series and it looks like social media uh, being a very very new method um, I can see that definitely being a a topic of, for future Another thing you might want to share with the group is which methods have you found to be most effective? I mean, I, I would assume it would be the ones that you're using the most, but not necessarily. Um, which methods have you found to just not really pan out at all? That might be something that uh, uh, anybody who's looking to expand their promotional methods uh, might want to be aware of. So. Um, while it's nice to share success stories, it's also good to share what, uh, what has not worked. So possibly others don't have to um, fall down that same trap. But then again, every program is different and we all have different audiences. So that is something you might want to in include, you know, why it didn't work for your target audience or the types of trainings. So we're going to let this go a little bit longer. It looks like the, uh, the responses are slowing down a little bit. Uh, feel free. And about six, uh, 30 seconds or so. Uh, we'll close this out and move on to the, the next topic. So please finish your thoughts. Or if you want to take this opportunity to copy everybody's responses and paste them off to the side on a Word document, uh, now would be the time to do so. But we'll show this again later uh, so you know. So next, we're going to cover developing training material. This is something we're going to talk about in all three of our webinars in this series, 
But what we wanted to focus on today is specifically building and giving effective presentations and slides. When you go to build and give a presentation, an important thing to consider before you get started is this. Who is your audience? What is their experience level? And what questions are they looking for you, looking for you to answer? And these are all things that you can get an idea of with the end user needs assessment that Brock was talking about earlier. Knowing these things allows you to have context for your presentation and allows you to know what you need to accomplish with your presentation. When you're building your presentation, it's important to cover your material thoroughly, clearly, and at a steady pace. But when you're delivering it, and this is going to be especially true if you're giving a technical talk, if your audience is new to the subject matter, you need to talk much slower than you normally do. Conversationally, for instance, I tend to talk pretty quickly, and especially when I'm giving a presentation, if I get nervous, I'm going to start talking far too quickly for people to understand what I'm saying clearly. So when you're practicing your presentation, think about how you're going to speak and how you can speak at a slow enough rate. Also consider that you need to speak clearly and you need to articulate well. If you're giving an in-person presentation and there is an option to use a microphone, please take it. I have been to many presentations where presenters are offered a microphone and they say, oh, I can talk loud enough. And sure enough, they really would have benefited from using a microphone. Unless there's some huge technical complication, please just go ahead and take it. It allows people in the back of the room to hear you clearly and hear you well, and it means that you don't have to strain your voice when you're talking. When you're covering material, even if you don't have an audience that's brand new to the material, Make sure you define your terms and your acronyms when you first use them. Uh, part of this is because terms you use may not be exactly the terms that they use. Um, you just might generally be in the community but not familiar with an acronym. And so making sure your audience knows what you're talking about is a really good idea. And don't assume that the audience is going to remember an acronym that you defined 20 slides ago. Go ahead and redefine things occasionally. The last thing is to make sure that you practice. A lot of people think that they can wing it when they give presentations, and it usually comes off kind of sloppy. Um, the other, another reason to do it is that for most people, when you're familiar with the material and where your slides are going, you're going to be a lot more confident with your presentation. And that just gives you more authority as a presenter because you sound more comfortable with what you're talking about. Practice is also able to help you figure out what presentation techniques are going to work for you. Um, when you're giving an online presentation, do you move your cursor around way too much? Um, do you need to be aware of that? If you're giving an in-person presentation, do you tend to wave your hands around too much when you talk? Do you tend to stand way too still? Um, so it's just figuring out which techniques are going to work for you. A lot of presentations, but certainly not all of them, involve a slideshow. There's certainly conventional wisdom that you shouldn't read off your slides, that you shouldn't try and jam all of your content onto a single slide. But there's also another consideration. What relationship does the presenter have to the slides? So what I mean is this. You can have slides with the idea and the context of what you're talking about on one end of the spectrum, where Almost all of your content is there, 95% of it is there, and the presenter is mostly there to give anecdotes and supplemental information. And this is really great if you have people looking at your slides later without you and you wanna make sure that they can understand everything that you're saying. And then the other end of the spectrum is something kind of similar to this slide where you just have very high level images, words, things on the slides, but you really need the presenter present to talk about what's going on. Our set slides typically live in the middle of this spectrum. While we do post our slides online and people can download them, we also want people to listen to our trainings and listen to our recordings. So they can get some of the content, some of the context out of the slides, but for the full picture and to get the full depth of the experience, you need to listen to the presenter and listen to the training. 
So once you figure out where on the spectrum your presentation is, there are a few key things about how you can develop a an effective presentation. Presentations should provide visual support for the audience, things that they can register as useful for them to retain. And while the person presenting should certainly take cues from the slides so that they can know where they are in the presentation so that they can keep focused on what's going on, they shouldn't use their slides as a teleprompter. And this kind of goes along with the idea that you shouldn't be reading off of your slides verbatim. And when you're developing these slides, especially when you've got lists and bullet points, use the slides to reinforce the points you're making. So instead of reading out the list of things on your slide verbatim, talk about the topic and show the audience what you mean, and they'll be able to look at those bullet points as references, as these are the high level things that I definitely need to remember. So this picture on the right is a, from a TED talk that was given by Fred Jansen, the former European Space Agency Rosetta mission manager in April of 2015. And when he was giving this presentation, his slides definitely fall on the more sparse end of the spectrum. But what you can see behind him is an image of the flight path of the Rosetta spacecraft as it's approaching the comet that it's eventually studied. And when you look at this, you can tell what he's talking about if you know his presentation. Um, and the image in the text tells the audience something, but it also reinforces the point he's making without a, a, a slide packed with words detailing all of the, the flight path that the satellite took. You know what slides should be, we're going to talk about some tips for how to accomplish those things. All three of the things on this slide here work together. On one level, if you make an inoffensive slideshow that doesn't break in the middle of your presentation, it's going to get the job done for you. But if you want to have a polished, professional looking presentation, consistency is one of the easiest things that you can do to refine your presentation. And a huge part of consistency is paying attention to detail. For me, when I'm under a tight deadline to turn a presentation around, Paying attention to detail is usually one of the things that just falls off of my radar first. But it's also the sort of thing that can very easily contribute to making your presentation look sloppy if you're not paying attention. So when you're building slides, make sure you pay attention to everything, but also make sure you don't get too carried away as you're building things and keep your presentation simple. So being consistent with your slides covers a wide range of things. Our set moved towards a template for all of our presentations in an effort to keep things consistent. Now, every presentation we give for all of our trainings isn't completely identical, but they all look like they belong in the same family of presentations. So what I mean is if you paid attention to our title slide at the beginning here, we also had this our set information, the title, more context, the NASA logo is at the top right, and there's also this image bar at the left. But what we do is for different trainings, we change that image so that it is the same throughout the series or the presentation, but it may not be the same for all of our presentations. For the interior of our presentations, they all have the same color background, they all use the same font, they all have the same bar feature to highlight the title of the slide. But you can see that this slide favors a single title, but this one has a title and a subtitle. So they all still look like they belong together while not being identical. And then another example are the transition slides we use. This image is the same image that we use um, on the left bar in the title, but it changes. But all of our transition slides have this trans semi-transparent background and the ability to put in the title. And so using this template enables us to really keep things consistent and make sure that things like the font sizes, the fonts, the color families, and just general formatting are sort of by default the same. And while you might have a template, you may still, you will still need to pay attention to detail. Are you using the same font in the body of your presentation? Um, 
you might want to use a different font to emphasize something, but make sure that you're intentional when you do things different. Make sure that if you're copying in a slide from another presentation, um, are all of the fonts the same? Are you using the same colors? Is everything still placed in the same place on the slide? For images, one thing that can make a huge difference in how polished the slide looks is whether or not the, the images are aligned with anything. So making sure that they might generally line up with the text, um, they're not all the way on the edge of the, the slide, things like that. And then another thing is making sure you maintain the correct ratio of an image. So this image right here is an example of something from the Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission. And if you put this image on your slide and you say, oh, I want it to fit in this particular space, let me just click on the sides, drag it, and make it smaller. But when you do that, especially if there's text, it becomes very obvious that there's something wrong with the image and it becomes kind of a distraction while you're giving your presentation. So just make sure that you're maintaining the height and width ratio of an image when you resize it. And that can make a huge difference in paying attention to detail. Um, the other thing about images is that it is very respectful if you pull something from a different source to go ahead and credit the image. The other reason, another reason to do this is if your attendee is going through your slides and they say, oh, that screenshot or that image from a particular source looks really interesting. I want to learn more about it. Having a credit allows them to go back and find that image somewhere else and find the source of the image. And then the other miscellaneous things to sort of pay attention to detail is considering the actual items and bullet points that you have on your slides. Are all of the items on your on your slide sentences or are they phrases? You can see on this slide it favors phrases, but it would look strange if all of the bullet points were sentences except for one. Um, how have you capitalized things? So here you can see in the subtitle, we've capitalized the first letter of every word, but for the main bullet points, we've only capitalized the first letter. And then for the sub bullets, they're all lowercase. So just making sure that you're applying the same capitalization across the board. Also being attentive to whether or not if all of the verbs on your slide are in present tense, except for one that's in past tense, um, or if your whole presentation is in past tense because you're talking about um, a previous conference that you attended, making sure that you're not suddenly speaking in present tense. And then the other thing is just making sure things like these individual bullets are the same bullet, right? So if that pesky slide you copied in from another presentation, we're using circles in this presentation, but did that one use arrows? Just going back and making sure that little things like that are consistent throughout your presentation. And as you're developing all of these things and paying attention, remember to keep it simple. This image is from when I gave this presentation a while ago to the RSET team. This was the this slide I used as the example. And you maybe don't have to keep things quite this simple. But it's important to remember that when you're writing a slide, it's a balance between writing everything down that you want to cover and providing highlights and memory triggers for your audience. Um, I once had a professor in college that felt that you shouldn't have more than 20 words on a slide. That's pretty minimal. This slide, for instance, has 60 words on it. So you don't, you don't necessarily need to follow a hard, concise deadline. But in general, just be present to keeping your slides and keeping your slides simple. And as you're developing your presentation, one way to do that is to only cover one idea per slide. Covering more than one idea at a slide at a covering more than one idea at a time can be tempting because you might have two ideas that connect and you want to complement each other. But having more than one idea on a slide is an easy way to end up with an overcrowded slide. Sticking to one idea can also help your audience focus on what they're supposed to be focusing on while you're talking. There are usually some hints that I use to help me identify if a slide is overcrowded. 
if you have text on the slide, but there are a number of colors happening and text is getting highlighted in very weird ways, what you're having problems with is competing attention. You're having struggles to draw attention to where you want attendees to look. And so that's usually a slide that there's, that's usually an indication that there's too much happening. When you're typing in a PowerPoint text box, if you run over, it automatically resizes the text and makes it smaller. And as soon as that happens, I usually stop and think about why I have so much text that it can't fit in that default box. And sometimes it's necessary and you just have to cut down some words, but other times it might mean that you really need two slides instead of one. And once you develop your slide or even your whole presentation, if you step, take a step back and you look at it and it's just a solid wall of text, that might be an indication that there's some things that you can condense, that you can edit, or that you can cut down, or maybe even add an image or a graph or something that will break things up a little. So now we're going to look at an example of a slide that needs some improvement. And it's a slide that's been generated from some general RSET content, but we can apply a lot of the things that we've just talked about to it. So there's kind of a lot happening on this slide. The very first thing that I notice when I look at it is that all of the content is bolded. And so I find that more difficult to read, but it just is kind of screaming at you of, hey, pay attention to everything you see. And so when everything is bolded like this, it makes it very difficult to emphasize the things that you need to emphasize. So this slide, they've been emphasizing things with different colors, but one thing they've done is there are five different colors happening on this slide in addition to the black text. You have two different shades of blue, you have two different shades of red, and then you also have this brown color. And you can see in theory where they looked at it and they said, well, let's match this blue spatial resolution to this table and this brown temporal resolution to this table as a cue for where you should look. But it's just a lot and it's very difficult to follow. I also want to take a moment and talk about the title of this slide. Titles are supposed to draw the attention of the person watching the presentation so that they know what to expect. This title is a full sentence rather than a quick at a glance overview of the material. We also talked earlier about consistency and capitalization. Here you have two different capitalization styles happening in the title. It starts out where every word is capitalized, but by the end of the title, you sort of devolve into sentence case so that all of the words start with a lowercase letter. And the other thing is that this title is kind of on the smaller side because it was so long, the, the font size got decreased. And so it makes it a little hard to focus on as top level information. So on this slide, the title is 18 point font, and it is one of three different font sizes happening, which is the number three itself is not necessarily too many font sizes. Um, it's just that there are three of them. The biggest font size on the slide is within the tables. And this happened when I clicked on insert table this is just the default font size that it popped up. So don't be afraid if you're inserting a table and it's too large to just go in and change it to the size font that you need it to be. Here the body text is two different font sizes as well, which frequently happens in PowerPoint where you have the default um, main level text is 20 points and the sub bullet is a little smaller at 18. But the problem with this is that now the sub bullet is 18, which is the same size as the title. So you have the two smallest fonts being content and title. And again, don't take away that everything on the slide has to be one size, but it's just important to pay attention to how your font sizes are drawing attention and whether or not it's creating confusion. The last thing to talk about in correcting is spacing. Spacing can serve as a visual cue to people watching and reading for where they should look. From an American perspective and in English, 
We typically read from top to bottom and left to right. And you should keep your writing direction in mind when you're developing slides because that's where our eyes go first. So since this presentation is in English, you typically are going to look at the top left first and that's just where people's eyes are gonna draw. And so the first thing you see is this line which is supposed to draw attention to the title, but the actual title isn't centered, it's too high. And there's also not enough space between the line and the title. The body of the text is also offset a little bit from where that line is. And so it, it just looks like something is a little off there. And you can also see that the text of the body comes up very close to the table and there's not enough space there to, to visually separate the two. The tables are also spaced differently. The one on the bottom has some, some spacing around the edges, but the blue table goes all the way to the edge of the slide so that it looks kind of like it's running off. And then the last thing about this blue table is that you can see that it's placed higher than the body text. And that makes it compete between it being higher than the body text and having a larger font size. It's competing with attention when maybe the table should be playing more of a supporting role. So now that we've gone through some things that need to be improved, here's an example of a suggested slide that follows our tips. I actually think that the strongest thing for this slide would be to split it into entirely two different slides, one on spatial resolution and one on temporal resolution, but for the sake of this exercise, we kept them as one slide. And so now you have a created hierarchy. The title is much more concise. It's the largest thing, and it's the first thing you go to to say, yes, this is a slide on spatial and temporal resolution. And then you have the two items um, put sort of in a list so that you can see everything about spatial resolution and the table that goes with it. And then you can also see the items about temporal resolution and the table that goes with that. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the first session of this three-part webinar series. Um, to summarize, what we talked about in the beginning and for this particular session uh, was developing a training mission statement, um, methods to assess end user needs, uh, how to build a network and different ways in which we promote and advertise our trainings, whether within our community or outside of our community. Um, what we'll do over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk a little bit more on developing training material, but focusing specifically on uh, how you're developing materials as it applies to in-person or on-site trainings versus online trainings or webinars. Uh, and how to conduct trainings in both of these types. And then also with methods in which you can evaluate your training, the training itself or the context or the impact of those trainings. So next week, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about on-site trainings on products. Our program manager will be talking about that, introducing the difference between online and on-site trainings. Uh, how, to, how to develop these on-site trainings, the different levels, the structure, uh, how we go about developing these case studies and hands-on exercises, timelines that, uh, that tend to be very useful when putting together these trainings, and then also a, a piece on program evaluation. Okay, so previously we had some topic-related forums. Uh, this one, however, uh, I, I, I want to open it up to any questions you might have had uh, about this training in particular, about any of the topics that we brought up, some of the reasons why. Um, so please, um, feel free to pose any questions to us. This is also a time that uh, if you didn't have a chance in the very beginning to sort of, if, if you want to, put down your name, your program, where you're from, 
uh, a little bit about your capacity building program or the one that you're hoping to uh, put together, uh, the educational structure uh, in which your organization, organization exists as it applies to teaching remote sensing, uh, this would be a great time to reach out and, and connect and network with your fellow remote sensing pra training practitioners. And in, in a little bit, we'll also open back up um, the each of the forum topics, each of the three forum topic periods, so you can Add any additional information or copy and paste those for your own for your own use. So I see your question about teaching with videos. Um, yeah, uh, that is a very effective way to do things. There's a, a lot of different programs that have what's termed as an e-learning platform or a knowledge management. Uh, content uh, software and they'll have the available where people can uh, attend their trainings and kind of self-pace themselves through the training materials through a series of exercises and videos um, you may have seen certain softwares such as Storyline that's uh, a very common one uh, used by certain organizations and they're done in an asynchronous fashion you don't have to show up live uh, each week. You can do it on, on, on your own, at your own pace. This is also something that RCID is going to be looking into. We've been doing a, a live format, uh, sparsed out over a, a couple different uh, weeks, convening at the same time each week, giving some time in between to review the materials, submit homeworks, do exercises, if it's an advanced training. Yeah, this is Elizabeth. Um, I also wanted to jump in and say, you know, Brock's talking about how great video is, and it is great. And um, a lot of softwares that do live webinars allow presenters to do videos as well. And we intentionally choose not to show presenter video, not because any of us are shy, um, but because it usually eats up a lot of bandwidth in the program. And so if you're accessing the training from somewhere that has a slower internet connection, um, having presenter video on can really destroy the stream very quickly. Thank you. Oh, I see a question here about assignments. No assignments for this three-part webinar series. So you don't need to worry about that. However, we have discussed in future iterations of these um, best practices, and uh, we, we hope that we start to really generate a, a community here, a, a self-organizing community, reaching out, networking with others, and sharing best practices when it comes to capacity building, as specifically as it applies to teaching remote sensing training and its application in real-world situations, disasters, water management, drought, agriculture, air quality, land management, habitat suitability, mapping, you know, all along these same ways. Uh, if, if we could all learn from each other on how to do it better, learn new techniques from each other, we're really trying to promote that. And I would say if, um, now we haven't found out a, a full foolproof way to do this or the best way so I I'll ask the group here um, if if there is a an online forum that you've used in previous opportunities like this in which you're able to keep an ongoing conversation with other participants um, Google Hangouts is an example um, I found varying degrees of success with Google Hangouts for these reasons uh, but if anybody is familiar with a, a way they would like to promote, I say go for it. Um, please open it up, reach out to the group, post it in a chat window uh, here or next week, and we can keep this community going. Like I said, self-organizing and um, creating networks, sharing what we've learned. I see a question about verifying attendance to the program. So. Yeah, if, if you're looking to obtain a certificate of completion 
for this training. You just have to attend all three sessions, live or recorded. So we'll have the recorded sessions available on our website by tomorrow. So you just need to attend all three. However, I will say that in order for this exercise to be more robust, I would highly encourage you to find time to attend live, uh, to share what you at your program does and how you attack these different topics. Um, because I, I know that others, I've learned quite a bit. We had a session this morning, uh, and from the session here today, I've, I've taken quite a few notes. And I can certainly see ways that we can employ some of the methods that have been discussed here already today. And I hope some of you have gained some, some, some nice knowledge as far as that's concerned as well. Um, so please uh, attend live. We set this up in uh, two different times throughout the day, hoping to reach as many time zones around the globe as possible. But in order to really do that, we have to do it three times a day, and that means we have to do it at like 2 a.m., which I'm sorry we're not going to do. So please review the recorded sessions if you have a chance. Your attendance is recorded by the software. So if you logged in here today, there is a record of you attending, so um, everything is uh, tracked. So don't worry about that. Um, there's a question here about if the RSET presentation slides are copyrighted. Um, the slides are not copyrighted. If you'd like to use the slides, um, you're welcome to. We just ask that you please credit RSET. Um, and if you have questions about the slides or want to use particular ones, please feel free to email us and we can talk to you about them. Um, there is a question here about how to use or try an equation in a presentation. Um, there are a few options. Anna, if you're on, you might be able to speak to this a little bit better. Um, I've seen people use uh, LaTeX and have that when they're sharing their screens. You can put equations into PowerPoint um, and do things that way. Um, I'm not sure. I hope that answers your question. We hope that uh, those attending today found some, some infor, information that they, they, they can go back and, and, and employ at your programs or in these sort of future capacity building endeavors. The promotion, the end user needs assessment, defining a good mission statement are really some fundamental things that uh, can be overlooked or could always use new ideas to accomplish. So we really wanted to start off this three-part webinar series addressing some of these uh, very basic um, ideas. But in the next couple weeks, we really get down to the nitty-gritty when it comes to putting together an in-person workshop or on-site workshop training, uh, as well as how we have taken that to the, the virtual realm using webinars series as you see right here and there's a lot of different ways that people are using the internet to reach a greater audience uh, a lot of very innovative ways a lot of different formats so I really look forward to uh, everybody sharing their ideas with us over the next couple weeks and I hope you learn a little something about the way we've been doing things as well but we do understand uh, not one size fits all, so uh, I, I look forward to uh, the conversations that, that, that get, get started from, from the next couple of weeks.
Okay, so we are going to shut down this part for today, and uh, please join us for part two. Thank you very much, everybody.